Hebrews 12, be turning there. Hebrews chapter 12 is where we'll take our text this morning. And uh, while you're turning there, I always like to remind you to pray for me that I'll be found um, preaching what the Lord would have me to preach. Hebrews chapter 12, and we're going to begin reading in the first verse. Hebrews chapter 12, in the first verse, the Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you. Lord, we pray this morning that you would uh, send your Holy Spirit this way because we know it is the teacher. God, that you would grant us understanding of your word, Lord, that you would... Uh, Make it clear to the lost that they stand most in need of you, Lord, that you would stir their hearts and make them living again. Lord, for those of us that are saved, that in the year that lies ahead of us, that we would be firmly committed to serving you once again. We would be faithful and praise you for these things. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, I'll be preaching this morning on waiting on joy. Joy is a great deal of happiness. Joy is something that's overflowing. And joy can be prompted by different things for different people. Now, you often wonder why there are so many drunks and drug addicts today. Well, that's their joy. Yeah. That's, that's what makes them happy. That's what makes them glad. And it should, be, it should be no mystery to us. Sin is joyful to most. That's where they find happiness. happiness joy is great happiness. Now, if you really think about it, you really probably are the only one that knows what truly makes you joyful, that makes you happy on the inside, and let me say this, if you're happy on the inside, it is going to come out so other people might know what makes you happy too, but you know best yourself what makes you happy, what gives you joy. Now, I believe Paul was the writer of this book as well, but what I believe really doesn't matter. The, the Bible doesn't give us an author. I think, I think Paul so respected the church at Jerusalem because it was the church, the first church of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the criticisms he offered in this book, he was, he was, he was very humble to make so he didn't take his name to them. But again, it doesn't say, but whoever uh, wrote the letter to the church in Jerusalem reminded them, hey, it's all of grace because they had brought works back to it. So that's two groups of churches that we know did. The church of Jerusalem and the churches of Galatia had sometimes somehow mixed grace and works back together. And so he reminded of them, and he reminded them the importance of faith. Now, back in the first verse, wherefore seeing, and that's his reference back to chapter 11, and that is the great hall of faith. You ever wondered if you would be in that group that, that your faith was so great in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ that it actually changed your whole life? Uh, to me, that to me that is results of redemption, faith that makes er, that all that makes the all important in your life, Christ Himself. Amen. Faith that will let you put aside family for your faith. And I've done that. I've, I've had that in my life more than once. 
where Christ had to be my first love. That's faith. And he, he writes, the, the writer includes a great deal of people in this hall of faith uh, in chapter 11. But if you turn back there with me very quickly, I want you to, to focus in on verse 31. Because this is an unusual character to be named among the others. Yeah. By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not. Now, you know the story when they were coming to take the, the, uh, the, the city of Jericho, the first great city, as they crossed the Jordan River, and how that they went around it seven times. But before that happened, they spied it out, and this hooker, this prostitute named Rahab became their friend. Isn't it wonderful that, that Christ is not particular of persons and not particular of your history? He, his grace far exceeds who you are. And he, here she is, named among people like Abraham and, and Isaac and, and named, uh, uh, as Brother Jared mentioned this morning, even uh, her name in with Enoch that walked with God. Here we find a prostitute named among those fathers of the faith. That's grace. And so looking at that and looking back at that so great cloud of witnesses, he begins to tell them in chapter 12 that wherefore seeing we are also compassed about so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that doeth so easily beset us. So we, we find that the writer here gives us two warnings, the weight and the sin. Now I have heard this preached where those two are combined together, but that is not what the scripture is teaching because there's an and in there. In other words, two different objects, two different ideas brought together, the weight and the sin. You ever thought what your weight is? Well, what brings you down? Is it your job? Is it your family? Is it... Is it money problems? That's your weight. That's your cross. What did Christ tell us to do? Take up your cross and follow him. But it gets cumbersome, doesn't it? So he says the weight and the sin. Now, who is he, who is he writing to? And we forget that when we're studying the Bible. Of the church letters, what are they all written to in unison? And that's a church. And what is a church? What is a church made up of? Saved folks, right? And so that means that you can have a way, and you can have a way, and you can have a way, and on top of that, you can have sin. We are not excluded from sin because we've been born again. It's still a problem for us every day that we live. And so the writer says you need, to, you need to put that aside, the weight and the sin in your life. If you wish to have joy, if you want some happiness in the years that you have left, lay that mess aside. You know what? The sun's coming up in the morning, right? And it doesn't matter if you have one dollar or two dollars, the sun will still come up. Right. Amen. And, and, and so we see that he reminds them of this. Lay that aside and let us run with patience. Now, unfortunately, patience is not my strong suit. I like it done yesterday. That, and I don't say that to brag. If I understand the scriptures like I think I do, that's a consistent request of character that he makes of his people is patience. You know what? 
The Lord's been gone for over 2,000 years now. That's patience. Right? All my life, 55 years, the imminent returning of Christ. Be patient. You know what patience is? Joy while you wait. Just joy while you wait. That's patience. Most of us don't have that. Uh, oh, what should happen, man? Uh, oh, it's getting late, and here we are still waiting. I'm 55 now, and Christ still ain't coming. And, and, and what's going to happen next? You know what you're doing? You're throwing your own joy out the truck window. And, and, and so we see then, as Paul is writing, or whomever the writer is, is writing to the church in Jerusalem, he says, if you want to be happy, run this race, not rapidly, not like you're going crazy, run it with patience, run it with love. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, if you underline in your Bible, uh, circle or underline that word set. Because what that means is your race, your line had not been set up. In other words, when mother and daddy were going to go to Germany, and mother didn't decide to go, and I was born here, and instead of born in Germany, that was already set. That was part of my race. You see what I'm saying? It shouldn't stress you out when unusual things happen, because you know what? They're set. Now, I've never run many races, believe it or not, I have, Run a couple. I had the PE award my freshman year of high school. And our race, I think it was two laps around the football field. And it was set. You know, you couldn't run across the 50 yard line. You had to go all the way down and all the way around and all the way back. It was set, it, it was the way we were to go. So when the devil tries to convince you, oh, the Lord has left you. No, no. The race has been set. Don't, don't, don't stress. That, that, that is an object. That is a method, if you will, of Satan. Don't let him do, it, do that to you. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Now, you know, if you think that your faith is mustered up in the flesh, you be careful, dear friend, because if it's a faith based on you, you know what? At some point, at some time, it's going to run out. But you know what? God's eternal, so a faith based by Him, it'll be there. You know, and when you look down, you know, uh, my wife and my daughter, uh, daughter, they are just like OCD about their gas tanks. And if they lend me their cars, they always get mad, mad, mad at me because when I get back, it's less than a quarter of a tank. And I'm like, well, I drove to Dover with the gas light on. Uh, and, but what we have in Christ is so much more. It's like running on a full tank all the time. Do we know the course? No. But we know Christ is going to be there for us. Do we know the next big uphill battle? No. But we know Christ will be there for us. And that is what we as the Lord's people need to remember as we go along the way is that, that our Christ is a faithful God. Look at the Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who, meaning Christ, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. Right. Now, I want you to see at the time of the crucifixion, remember when they went into the Garden of Gethsemane? And a lot of people think that Christ was monitoring or, or thinking about 
the misery, the, the carnal, fleshly misery of what the crucifixion would be. And it, and it was an extremely, extremely violent death. Very, very painful. He endured that for you and for me and for all the redeemed. He went through that. Others suggest that his real weary in that time was being separated from his father because they never had been. They had always been in unison. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, they had always dwelt just like this in one person, in, uh, in one being, in three persons, and now one was going to be for a short time separated, separated away, and God Jehovah was going to turn his back on his own son. And some even said he was stressed about that. I guess really it could have been either way, don't you? Or maybe both. But I do know this, how do you get through it? But well, the scripture said he had for the joy that was set before him. He could see the joy. He could see the happiness that this event was going to happen. Listen, dear friend, are you discouraged this morning? Look at the joy that is still before us. Look, look at the time when he says, it's enough, come up here. Or when you yield your last breath and your eyes open at the foot of the cross, at the foot of Jesus Christ. Listen, that's the joy that's set before us. Think about it. On your worst work day. Listen, Sunday's coming. <laughs> It might be prayer meeting night. The joy that's before us. Yeah. See, a lot of times the problem is all we do is look at the here and now. Right. <clears throat> well, boo-hoo. Well, if you're having a boo-hoo day, and we all do from time to time, look ahead. Look at the joy that's coming. Look at the grace that, that, that he's provided. So many, many times... Our happiness, our joy is taken from us because of how we look at things, how, our perception of what's going on. Now, go with me uh, very quickly to Galatians. And we spoke of these churches of Galatia just a second ago. But Galatians chapter 5, uh, verse 22, very familiar verses of scripture. scripture uh, Galatians 5 and verse 22 the Bible says, but, for the, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Now, I think if, I, if my memory serves me correct, there's seven there, or maybe seven. And uh, the second one is joy. So if you have no joy this morning, if you have no happiness, and if you're not glad, you're missing a piece. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, mercy, faith. And so we find that love is quintessential and joy is too. You know what? If, if you're redeemed, and, and these are fruits of the Spirit, so you, you can't have these if you're not saved. But if you're saved and you have some of the fruits of spirit, and I understand this verse correctly, it, 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 it's tied to salvation, and either you never had it or Satan took it from you. I remember the day the Lord saved me. I, I, I was on cloud nine. I was walking high. I was rejoicing in the Lord. You know what? I had joy. But since that time, 40 plus years ago now, I've had some dark, dark days. And the only thing I can come to is I've got my eyes off the prize. You know, we need, we need to admit that sometime, don't we? Yeah, I, I, I'm not looking at things like I ought to be looking at them. So this joy, this happiness that we're talking about this morning, you're entitled to it. Now, I don't like that word, entitled, because it makes me think of welfare programs. 
I, I don't know nothing in this life that we're entitled to. But this we are. It's a spiritual thing. If you're saved, you're entitled to be happy, to be joyful. So why aren't we? Why are God's people so miserable? Either you let Satan snatch it, or you handed it to him on the silver platter. There you go. And, and, and so we see that the Lord's people need to be joyful. We need to be a happy, glad people in the days that we have left. Now, just flip over the next page, Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now, I want you to notice two things here, that we do get tired of well-doing, do we not? Listen, I believe well-doing is serving Christ with everything you have, taking what you have and giving it completely unto Christ. The way you look, what you wear, where you go, who you hang with, everything about you given unto Christ. Now that will make you glad in the spirit, but if you get in the flesh, you'll be very, very, very miserable. What am I doing? This is crazy. I don't have any friends anymore. Are you in the flesh or are you in the spirit? Right? Because if we're in the spirit, we'll be glad. And if we're in the flesh, we'll be mad. And, and, and so we find that Paul encourages the churches of Galatia that they, that they stay in the situation that they're in. Let us not be weary in well-doing. Serving Christ correctly. Serving Christ with gusto. For in due season, we shall reap. Due season. Now, uh, I don't even know anymore because most of, a lot of our bills just come out of our checking account. But used to, your light bill had a due time. And what happened if you didn't pay your light bill? They come off and shut it off. You know, they don't even have to come out to your house anymore and they shut it off in their office. That's pretty trendy, ain't it? But you got your, it was, it was due. Now, this is the thing. I don't, and this sounds crazy, and this is when you get old, you remember things more from a child than you can now. But mother's light bill was due on the 10th, and she was like OCD about the light bill. Uh, she would send it off on the first. I'm like, mother, we don't even know what it is yet. But I mean, it went out on the first. And, you know, it was due. It was, we need to know that there is a specific time coming that when all this will be worth it all. And you know what? You won't get discouraged if you keep your eye on the due season, at the due time. But what what people, what the devil wants is you to get so much in the mire right here and right now that the due time means nothing to you anymore. I'm looking for the due time. I, I'm looking ahead because if we don't, the misery that we now live in will envelop you and you will be no good for Christ at all. Now go with me to 1 Samuel 18. We're going to look at a little bit of a case in point, and we're going to be done. 1 Samuel 18 in the very first verse. 1 Samuel 18 in the very first verse, it was the days of David. Goliath was dead. They had gone to another battle, and David was again very victorious. In the first verse it said, And it came to pass when he had made an end of the speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Now, I want you to see a key element 
in that happiness is having to someone to walk with. Now, uh, I don't know who, you, who yours is. More than half of us is married. And, and, and I, I am knit with Donna. And what that means is when the time does get a little, a little rough, maybe she'll say, Larry, you need to look at the goal. You need to look at the big picture. And when she gets down and out, it's like, Donna, you're focusing on this in the wrong way. Look at the prize. Look at the long haul. Remember, Christ said for the joy that was yet before him. It's not now. It's not present. It's ahead. And, and so we find this unusual relationship. And remember, Jonathan is the son of Saul, the son of the man who would uh, wreak havoc on David's life. But yet and still, they were very, very close. Verse 2, and Saul took him that day and would let, not let him go uh, no more home to his father's house. And Jonathan and David made covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. In other words, he gave him his whole identity. The girdle was like a thing that went right here, usually had a medallion on it, and it said who you are. Maybe, yeah, y'all know those big 70s belts, uh, cowboy belts, and had a buckle this big on it? Kind of the same thing. And, you know, back then it would have, you know, if, if you were a hippie, you might have a peace sign there. Or since my last name is Lafferty, I might have me a, a big turquoise L there. Yeah, they, they were hideous. But, you know, that. That's kind of what this device was. It showed who you are. And we're knit together now. We're, we're going to be the same. We need that, do we not? What about your church? We need that to be for each other, do we not? I see you kind of down and out today. Tell me what's going on. You know, we live in day and day. Most people think that was too far. Well, if you, you, you see me down and out, you, you put your arm around my back and say, Pastor, I'm praying for you anytime you want to. Because, see, that puts me back on the joy that's set before me. That gets me out of the down and out and the, the stuff going on now. We need those type of relationships. And sad to say, in the modern day, there's not a lot of that going on. Uh, and, and if somebody don't applaud what you do, then everybody gets mad and upset. And, and so they had this very, very special relationship. Verse 5, And David went out whithersoever Paul sent him and behaved himself wisely. And Saul sent him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and, all, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Now, I want you to see, you find advancement when you have your eye on the prize. Now, there will always be an enemy out there somewhere who gets upset. But if you keep your eyes on the prize, there's advancement. Said that he moved him down to his own castle. <laughs> Said that he that that he put him over all the armies, and what did it do? Was David proud and robust? No. It says that he behaved himself wisely. You you don't take advantage of those things. You use them for the benefit of the kingdom, and that's exactly what he did. He was he, he was used of God in a great and wonderful way, <laughs> and he kept his eye. On the goal. He kept his eye on what God had given him to do. And remember, he had already been anointed by this point. So he knew what the goal was. And he didn't ignore it. Verse 7, I mean, verse 6, and it came to pass as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy, 
and with instruments of music. Now, I want you to see this behavior, this conduct, this godly conduct of David made others happy too. We see, we see sin, we see a type of Satan being defeated in the Philistines, and it makes God's people glad. It makes them happy. And then David begins to get what Saul thinks is a little too much attention. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the older I get, I, I wasn't always sure that Brother Downs was right. Most things me and him was just like this. Something. But he told me, he said, I don't even think Saul was saved. I think he's a type of the Antichrist. And I was like, Downs? <laughs> and, but the older I get, the more I see Saul was a fake. And we often think, well, he preached. Well, Balaam's ass preached too and didn't make her saved, did it? Right? Animal can't be saved. Uh, and, and so we find that that thing that tears us all down if we're not very careful, jealousy. And they had this song going, and they, you know, it's almost a little Pentecostal service. They're dancing and singing and running. And David, uh, Saul has killed his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And that's where it struck. See, if you want to keep your, if, if you're serving the Lord well and you have your eye on the joy that's set before you, you're always going to have people that are jealous. And you know why? Because they don't have their eye fixed. They ain't looking at the joy before them. They're looking at you. Right? And, and so we find in this situation... The joy, was, the joy was not was not Saul's. David had joy. <laughs> the nation had joy. But Saul didn't. You know what that tells me? Joy is not universal. Now, if you got your eye on the joy before us, yes. But jealousy will cripple you. And if you're jealous of someone, you do not have your eye on the joy set before. You have your eye on that individual that makes you jealous. And, and, and so we find that the situation, and we all know it becomes lethal eventually, was all because Saul did not have his eye on the joy. Verse 8, we're just going to read half the verse. And Saul was very wroth. And the saying displeased him, and he said, David described unto David ten thousands, and me they have described but thousands. What can we have more but the kingdom? So, are you joyful this morning? Now, first and foremost, I have to say, You'd be lying if you told me you're joyful all the time, right? But I would have to say at this very moment, at this very time, you're one way or the other. Now, if you're not joyful from, from what we've studied this morning, the root cause, we have a thing we call it worth the root cause analysis. The root cause is that you don't have your eye on the prize. You're looking at one another, or maybe you're looking at the TV, or maybe we're looking at these a little too much. Like, oh no, look what's happening in Israel. No, no. Joy set before me. You know what's going to happen in Israel? I can tell you very much so. Exactly what God wants to happen in Israel. And that's enough for me. Is the Temple Mount going to be vacated one day? Probably. I almost say definitely. But I might not live to see it. 
So I'm gonna keep my eye on the joy that's set before me. You know what? My joy, if he said for the joy that set before him, his joy was, it says it in the next sentence, was to set at the right hand of God. Right? That was the joy. <laughs> I'm gonna be setting at the feet of Jesus. That, that, that's joy enough for me. I want to finish my course. I pray to the Lord, if it don't mark the children too much, that I die behind that pulpit. I want to finish up doing what he called me to do. That would be joy for me. Joy set before me. What's your joy? Now, if you're one of God's, your joy is to serve him. If you're not, you know what your joy is? And this is very scary. Your joy is to flee from him. Because being near him, you know what it does? You realize how accountable you are to him. What makes you, what makes you joyous? You happy this morning? That's what joy is, right? We, we rolling off a brand new year. Is 24 going to be good for you? If you keep your eyes on the joy set before you, it will. If you keep your eye on the TV, you'll be boohooing before dark. Right? Keep your eye on the prize. 